Good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. I uh, hate to see all the, the good fellowship, but we're going to let them get started this morning. So if you're able, please stand with us as we open our worship service with the Lion and the Lamb. morning, God, as we uh, begin our time together and as we prepare to look into your word, I pray that you would just quiet our hearts, that you would clear our minds, uh, that you would help us to see your word afresh and anew today. Uh, God, may we learn uh, more today from Paul's example of praying for the church. Uh, may we learn that the things that we can apply to our lives, um, that, that we can see played out in our lives, and, and may our lives be changed because of it. May you be honored and glorified. So we just commit our time to you today. 
I just pray that you would be at work in us and through us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So I'm going to make quick work of the announcements this morning. Uh, first thing I just want to do is remind you of the connection card, the tarot portion of the inside of your bulletin. Uh, you can utilize this to uh, make uh, a prayer request known, to update contact information. Uh, if you're visiting with us, uh, we do welcome you this morning. We extend a special welcome to you uh, for the fact that you are visiting with us. But we do ask that if you're visiting with us this morning, if you would take that connection card. Um, and uh, I just got significantly louder. I don't know what happened, but I can hear it myself. Um, if you would take that connection card and fill it out and just drop it in the offering plate uh, as you make your way out the door this morning so that we can have a record of your visit with us um, today. Now, that being said, uh, I'm going to cheat this morning and tell you that the announcements in the bulletin are the exact same as they were last week. Uh, so, again, I would just invite you to glance through that, check out what we got there. I want to remind you about the tennis and food pantry. That's new and up and running. We've been asked just to make you all aware. There's a box for uh, items that you uh, can donate if you feel led to donate uh, to that, that food pantry there at the tennis and uh, uh, food pantry. Couldn't spit it out. There's a box in the foyer for that. Main thing I want to remind you of this morning is the membership class um, that is scheduled two weeks from today. If you are interested in being a part of that membership class, uh, we, we, we'd ask you to sign up by next week, so you may do that today. Um, and again, we just want to remind you that the membership class isn't necessarily you saying, I want to be a member, but this is the best, most concise way uh, for you to just learn a little bit more about Dale Bible Church, who we are, what we desire to do, and how it is that we want to do what we desire to do. And um, so we invite you to be a part of that and uh, learn a little bit more about our church uh, through the process. Before I read our call to worship this morning, I do want to uh, remind you of this month's memory verse. It's Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. We will get to that um, within the next few weeks. I hope to be there by the end of September. Uh, but the Apostle Paul writing in uh, chapter 4, he says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. A lot there. I will wait and unpack that when we get to it. Um, but just uh, a great reminder of how God has blessed the church and gifting the church with various people to fulfill various roles for one purpose. Edifying the body. Building up the body of Jesus Christ. So I encourage you to commit that to memory as we prepare to uh, dissect that verse with a little more detail in the coming weeks. This morning's call to worship is found in Revelation 4. We're actually going to read the chapter in its entirety. John writing says, After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. The first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. And once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Amelia. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, at, before the throne, there was as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and You created all things, and by your will they existed. And were created. I invite you to stand with us and to join us as we continue to worship with Zero. Mm -hmm. 
may be seated. Take your Bibles if you have not done so. Or if you are preparing to do so, open them to Ephesians chapter 3. We'll continue way through Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. This morning I want to examine together five reasons why the Apostle Paul prays. Uh, we found out again uh, in the book of Ephesians where the Apostle Paul has just spent some time in prayer. We touched on this last week when we, we talked about he, he began chapter 3, For this reason I, Paul, prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. Remember we said last week that really his prayer was set to begin right there. Uh, but instead he digressed and he had some things to say um, about the gospel and his uh, responsibility to preach it. And, and last week we unpacked this in God's sovereignty in various areas of our lives. But this morning we find ourselves uh, picking up really where Paul left off and examining his prayer. And I want to begin by just... Um, I guess maybe leveling with you, reminding you of, of something that I, I've shared with you before. Um, this is not one of the things that I'm most proud of, but it is a reality in my life. I mentioned to you before, if you've been here for any length of time, you've probably heard me say this, that I have a tendency to be too self-reliant. That's to say, in the context of church, in the context of the Word of God here, I'm prone to about the role or the importance, if you will, of prayer in my life. And to be honest, this forgetfulness is demonstrated by the lack of prayer in various areas that accompanies my life in different seasons. And, 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 and I, I think, um, I, would, I don't think, I would submit to you this morning that as a believer, prayer should be one of the very defining of our lives. There's a reality that uh, prayer is one of the things that is easily a forgotten push to the side. Especially if you're like me as a, as a man and you're task oriented, your checklist needs, you got to get working through it. You got to get stuff done. And so we, we tend to forget about the importance of prayer. And it ought to be the opposite because there are no aspects of life that do not require the intercession of Jesus Christ on behalf of the believer through the act of prayer before the Father. But sadly, my previously stated self busyness, fatigue, lack of faith, and other potential factors can rob me of my privilege of the benefit of praying with more regularity and with more consistency. Come across a story this week of a young man named Danny Simpson. I'm not sure when this event happened, but some time ago. But this young man, Danny Simpson, at the age of 24, robbed a bank in Ottawa, Canada. He robbed this bank at gunpoint. He robbed the bank of $6,000. He went into a bank with a gun and he left with $6,000. Shortly after Danny was captured, the real tragedy of this story came to light. The tragedy of the story is that the weapon that Danny used to rob the bank of six thousand dollars was a 1918 45 caliber semi-automatic Colt, valued at over a hundred thousand dollars. Danny Simpson robbed the bank for six grand with a weapon that was valued at over a hundred. See, Danny's problem was that he didn't know what he had in his hands to begin with. Had Danny known, he probably wouldn't have chosen to be a thief. He probably wouldn't have robbed the bank. What he would have realized was what he already had in his possession was far more valuable than what he would stand to get by robbing the bank. And I would. See, he didn't understand the power that was available to him. As the owner of the gun, what Danny really desired was already in his possession. For the believer in Jesus, prayer is a lot like this reality. There is so much available to the believer in Jesus Christ through the act of prayer, but we don't take advantage of what God offers to us and affords us through the God-given gift of prayer. 
And I'm going to submit to you this morning that I believe that I'm not alone in this struggle. I'm not alone in the tendency to become too busy, too fatigued, and too self-reliant. The bottom line is prayer is a habit that needs forming in our lives. And so perhaps this morning you too struggle with prayer. Perhaps like me, it's busyness. Perhaps like me, it's self-reliance. Or perhaps it's any of the other things that we've mentioned or even something that we haven't. One thing specifically that I haven't mentioned, and I believe this is a reality even for church people, is that sometimes doubt creeps in. We wonder, does prayer really even make a difference? What's the point in praying if God already knows what's going to happen anyways? If I this morning, I would submit to you that I find these are the kinds of questions people ask about prayer, even in the church. Even as professing believers. It is my experience, even with church people, that they're not convinced at times. I don't want to make a, a sweeping statement and say that this is always the case of people's lives that maybe we've, I've interacted with in the past. But there's definitely seasons where they wonder if God even hears them. Is my prayer even effective? But what we must understand is that through prayer, the believer has full access to everything that God offers to the believer. And Paul demonstrates through his prayer this morning in our text why he prays. So he prays for the Ephesian church and in doing so helps us to see why he prays. Another way that we might put this is by, by way of Paul praying and writing his prayer for us, we see some of the benefits of praying. We see the reality of the believer praying and receiving just some of what God has said. This is available to my children through prayer. With what Paul says to the Ephesians as he prays for them, is incredibly telling. Maybe we do wonder this morning, why does my prayer life lack? Maybe you don't wonder. Maybe you know why prayer is a struggle for you. Morning, if you if your prayer life ebb and flows, lots of times, unfortunately, like mine does, um, if prayer is just a struggle in general, um, I would encourage you this morning to um, consider what Paul would say through these seven verses. And maybe you're here this morning, and your prayer life doesn't really ebb and flow. Maybe the reality is one of the one of the the, the, the great ways that God has strengthened you and encouraged you and built you up and wired you and geared you is that prayer is something that's natural for you. There are people that... Uh, prayer is not natural for anybody unless it's you work towards that. And so what I'm saying is maybe you're at that point in your life where prayer is natural for you. I would encourage you this morning to also recognize that Paul can encourage you as well of how to be an encouragement for those who are struggling with. So if you're here this morning and you say, you know what, I'm thankful that my prayer life is strong. And, and that's not, you know, I can't really relate with those ebbs and flows and up and downs. I would encourage you this morning to, 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 to hear what Paul would say in order that God might use you uh, to help someone else, to pour into someone else's life about the role and the importance of prayer. Maybe this morning can serve simply as a reminder to you of what you have in your hands by way of what God has afforded you with the purpose the power of prayer. So I'd ask you if you'd stand with me this morning. We'll read our text together and we'll make some observations from it. Again, this is the Apostle Paul writing Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 4. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power of work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. 
Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you this morning for your word. And we do thank you, uh, as we do oftentimes, just for the reality that it is the test of time. That though the word of God is the most heavily, heavily scrutinized book in all of human history, it is the most widely recognized and most uh, widely uh, sold and received book in all of human history. Why this is, God, is not a surprise to us because we understand that they're the words of life. It's the words of truth. It is, it is your very word, God, breathed out and given to us that we might better know you. And so this morning, God, as we examine Paul's prayer to the church at Ephesus, may we see how uh, we receive blessing and how we benefit from engaging in the act of prayer. But God, even before that, may we see your goodness to us in, in, in such a way that you have given your son Jesus to break down the wall of hostility that invites us into your presence. Prayer is not inherently about us. Even though we receive blessing from it, and even though you work in our lives through prayer, God, prayer is not about us. It's simply a reflection of your goodness to us, your faithfulness to us. And, and God, we're pointed to the realities of who Jesus is and what Jesus has accomplished when we consider the reasons why we ought to pray. Work in our hearts this morning, God, that we might see the importance of prayer, that we might be encouraged and built up this morning, that we might leave here and say, oh God, may we seek to develop a prayer life whereby we can better know and understand you and where our lives can be changed for your glory and the good of those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Paul begins this section uh, really with two things. He begins this section by highlighting his posture. It's his posture that he records for us that tells us that he is praying. And the reality is the posture of prayer says something. That isn't to say that if we don't get on our knees and pray, as he says, for this reason, on our knees before the Father, that's not to say that God doesn't hear our prayer they're less effective if we don't get on our knees and pray. But my wife can attest to this. Um, many of you have heard me talk about uh, my mentor. Uh, my mentor is Mr. and Mrs. C. And, and particularly the role that Mr. C has played you know, in my life and, and, and discipling me and, and uh, really the role that he's played in me being where I'm at today. And I remember you, you, know, you know, Mr. C is in his late 80s now. So we go back 15 years, Mr. C was in his early 70s. And I still remember being at opportunities for prayer, whether that was following um, Bible study together, whether that was following a prayer meeting at the church, wherever the case was, when it came time to pray, and we would break up into these groups where people would pray, a man in his mid-70s would get down on his knees, he would turn and face the people, and, you know, whatever group of people he's praying with, and for the duration of our prayer time, I'm going to tell you something, when Mr. C prayed, he prayed. Okay. So we're not talking about a man in his mid-70s just getting down on the ground for a few seconds while we shared a few kumbayas and said a few things and got up and went on about our business. We're talking about a man earnestly agonized over the reality of entering into the presence of God through prayer. And, and that, I will remember that as long as I'm able. It doesn't really matter what the circumstances were for him, his desired posture, as long as his body allowed him, his desired posture is to be knelt before the throne of God. Is he, is he engaged with God in this action of prayer? And again, I don't want to suggest that if we're not kneeling, our prayer is not earnest or effectual. Um, you just see something um, significant, right? Like if you walked into church for a prayer meeting or on a Sunday morning... <laughs> And, and, and we're praying, and everybody's looking at me, and we're just kind of sitting here. That's not bad or wrong, okay? But if somebody went to walk into church, and we, were, and we were in a portion of a service or a meeting where it was prayer time, and you walked in, and there was eight, ten groups of people who were knelt together, who were praying, 
it just looks different. I'm not telling you that it necessarily is different. I'm just painting a picture whereby you see Paul is acknowledging this, this picture of, of humble submission, of entering into the presence of God, whereby the only thing that he believes he's fit to do is fall on his face before God and as a humble sinner, as a humble sinner offer up a prayer. He also tells us why he's doing this. The first few words of this section are for this reason. There's a reason why Paul hits his knees in prayer. And the reality is that in a nutshell, he's praying that they would be strengthened to fulfill the task that God has given to his church. We saw last week about the reality of God's sovereignty. God's at work in the lives of his people in the midst of their misery or their suffering. God sovereignly be at work in the midst of their misery uh, that often accompanies that misery and God sovereignly being at work in the midst of ministry. That's not limited to pastors, missionaries. All of God's people are involved in ministry and God is sovereignly over that. But Paul does not neglect the reality that, like we said last week, sometimes ministry is hard. Sometimes just following Jesus, whether you're in ministry or just a lay person following Jesus, it can be hard. And Paul says, for this reason, that you would be strengthened, so that you would be built up ultimately, I, I earnestly hit my knees in prayer before God for you. reality is believers need to be fit to accomplish the task that God has for them. And this is the reality of Paul's prayer. And our text this morning presents five reasons why Paul prays. Five things, we might say, or five, five actions that happen when God's people pray that equip them to fulfill the task that the church has been given when we understand our responsibility to be a part of something bigger than ourselves, that we're a part of a, 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 a worldwide task that God has given to his church to make disciples, we begin to see the importance of prayer when we understand the role that it plays in our lives. So with that, let's examine five reasons why the Apostle Paul prays. Firstly, I want you to understand that the Apostle Paul prays for strength. For the believers in Ephesus. This is verses 16 in the first part of 17. So he hits his knees, he prays to the riches of, the, of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Paul begins by praying for strength, praying that the believers in Ephesus would be strengthened. And what we may miss. In the English translation is the reality of the request for strength. The way that this is written in the original language, that is the Greek, communicates that Paul is praying for something to happen that the believers in Ephesus cannot do themselves. Paul is praying that the believers would understand that the strength that they need to fulfill the task that God has for his church, they cannot muster up in and of themselves. The strength to be used by God, for God, to accomplish his task and his purposes comes from him. And so this is how Paul is praying. The reality of, of the believers, that they would be strengthened. This strength comes from God. It is God who does the strengthening. I love how Paul qualifies this strength. The strength that God provides for us to fulfill the task comes according to his, or to, it comes according to the riches of his glory. It's important that believers realize that God graciously gives the strength that the believers need. Also, it's important that we understand that God's resources for strength to the believers are limitless. And we'll, actually, we can apply that to all of the things that we'll look at this morning. Because Paul tells us this, the resources that God has for his church are limitless. There is no way whatsoever, no how, that God's 
people could ever exhaust the resources of God. And the importance of the strength in the believer's life is realized in the fact that this strengthening comes as a result of the, the, uh, of the, the, the biblical truth that Christ dwells within the believer. Christ dwelling within the believer is the key to everything. Christ dwelling within the believer is the key to the believer living a life that is productive for Jesus. A lot of this comes down to because Christ dwelling within the life of the believer is our barometer, is our grounds, and is our gauge for our moral conduct. Why we do what we do in the church. You see, apart from Christ dwelling in us, apart from being filled with the presence of Christ in us, which Paul would say in Galatians, Gal Galatians, that's Ephesians and Galatians put together. Paul would say in Galatians that the believers are to be filled with the Spirit. Well, believers receive the Spirit one time at conversion, but the reality is their lives are continually filled with the influence and the presence of the Spirit as we take in the Word of God, as we exercise a prayer, things of that nature. So when we consider the reality of why we do what we do in the church, we have to understand that the influence of Christ in our lives is going to go a long ways in determining how we do what we do and why we do what we do. When Christ is at the forefront of what we do, we're going to do things differently than what we do when he's not. Or when we're not filled with him. When we're not strengthened, as Paul says. Living in unison with Jesus allows the believer to be in step with Jesus. Which, once again, is how Jesus works through the believer. Paul prays for strength for the Ephesian believers, but he also prays that they would be grounded. Notice the second part of verse 17. That you would be rooted and grounded in love. The result of being strengthened or walking in step with Jesus is that the believer is grounded. They have a good foundation. Paul says strength and the indwelling presence of Christ Results in this foundation being built, this rooting having take place, having taken place. It also results in love, understanding love. And when I think about this reality of being rooted or being grounded, I don't know about you, but my mind goes to Psalm one. And in Psalm one, the writer says, "Blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night." a little bit further in Psalm 1, that the result of that delight is being rooted like a tree that is planted by streams of water and is prosperous. Again, the presence of Christ within the believer grounds the believer. It's the presence of Jesus in the life of the believer whereby you see that, that, that reality of prosperity, not health and wellness prosperity, Prosperity in the sense that we're productive and, and, and we are accomplishing the task that God has given to his church. It's only through the presence of Jesus that the believer can understand the love of Jesus. This is why he would say that through this grounding, uh, they, would, or they, they would be rooted and they would be grounded in love. As we're grounded, as we're rooted, we understand the love of Christ as well as love for others as a representative of Christ. See, that's, that's the reality of what Paul is praying. The, ta the church has been given a task. The church has been given a job that, that surpasses everything else. The church's responsibility, primarily, of utmost importance, is to make disciples. I want you to understand something. It's hard to make disciples when you don't love people. It's hard to love people when you're not grounded and rooted in the love of Jesus for you and for people. I mean, it's no secret. Loving people is hard because people are difficult. We were having a, I don't even remember what the context was last night, but we were, we were having an elders meeting. We were talking about something to do with 
uh, you know, just ministry and people. And I can't even remember what it was, but it was talking about something to do with, with sometimes things being difficult. And, and one of the elders saw that's because there's people involved. And we laugh in a sense because we get it, right? Um, anytime there's people, we need the help of God to love people. And that's both in and out of the church. And, and, and this is a reality. When, when Paul's speaking to the Ephesian church, you know, as they're praying, he's praying for them and encouraging them, reminding them that they have the same opportunity to pray, whereby they can be grounded and rooted in the love of Jesus for them and for others, rendering them effective to the call of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Later on in this letter, Paul will unpack the importance of believers having love for one another. Here, Paul talks about the love of God for the believer and our ability to love in light of that. Thirdly, I want you to realize that through prayer, we have the opportunity for intimacy. Verse 18, when he talks about being grounded in love, he says, you may have strength to comprehend what all the saints, with all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. One of the most relevant aspects of prayer for the believer is the ability to experience an intimate relationship with the God of the universe. We talk often about the reality of the Word of God and that the Word of God has been given by God that we could know God, know how to relate to God. The primary means that God has given His church to relate to Him is prayer. If you want to experience intimacy with God, and if you want your relationship with God to grow, to flourish, pray. We think about this, excuse me, we think about this reality of fellowship, or excuse me, of intimacy with the God of the universe. Don't be scared off by the word intimacy. This is not an inappropriate thing. Rather, it's a sweet and exciting opportunity for the believer to experience close fellowship with God. It's amazing how these things Paul prays for are building upon one another. As they're grounded in God's love, they begin to comprehend, just begin, they begin to comprehend the depth of love, of the depth of God's love for mankind. It's amazing to me that Paul would even pray that the Ephesians would know the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth of God's love. And this is amazing because as we've touched on, the resources of God in general, but also in light of his love, are inexhaustible. You cannot exhaust God's resources of his love for you. Paul is not encouraging the Ephesian church to try to understand something that they can't because it's not exhaustible. No, rather he is inviting them through prayer into the relationship with God where intimacy is found. Whereby entering into this intimate interaction with God, you begin to unpack and explore and understand the height, the depth, the width, and the breadth of God's love for you, of God's love for mankind. See, the reality is we'll never understand God or God's love apart from communion with God. We, we live in a world where in, 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 in the church, not even so much outside of the church, but we live in a world in the church where we've kind of detached, you know, uh, we would agree that we've kind of went way far in God's love. So do whatever you want. Hey, be, you know, X, Y, Z, A, B, C. And so we've counteracted that by, by neglecting God's love. But, but Paul's telling the church in Ephesus here that as he prays for them, he's praying that they would understand just how great God's love for them is. That they would grow in their understanding and their affections for God as they understand his affections for them. A believer in Christ can spend their whole life searching out the depth of the love of God and they would never reach the end of it. And Paul doubles down in the first part of verse 19 when he talks about the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. If you can't even fully comprehend the way in which God loves you. And that's before you consider the rest that you are. 
That's before I consider the wretch that I am. Even before I think about just how vile of a human being I am by nature and how vile my life was apart from Jesus before coming to Christ, before any of that, before any of that is the reality of, of God's love for me, for us, for you. And his love is... It, his love is beyond the reality of us being wretched sinners. That's why his grace has been extended in order that we might be saved wretched sinners. And so Paul calls the believers through prayer to meditate upon the reality of God's love for them. That they would grow. When we meditate upon the reality of God's love for us, the result is that we would grow in our adoration and our admiration and our understanding and our experience of God's love for us. God's love for me blows my mind because I don't deserve to be loved by God, but yet God extends his love through Jesus. So we have the opportunity for intimacy. And Paul also helps us to see this morning that as we pray, as we seek uh, God, through prayer, is the opportunity for fulfilling. It's the second part of verse 19 and into verse 20. That you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. We find once again here that the reasons, is, as Paul prays, the way that he does, again we find these reasons, they're compiling, they're building. The outflow of strength and grounding and intimacy is filling. Paul desires that the Ephesian believers would be filled with the fullness of God. As we've noted, the fullness of God can never be resourced. It's a never to be full, to be filled with the fullness of God. This is a regular part, daily, moment by moment, hour by hour, of the life of the believer. To be growing closer in fellowship and deeper in, in unison with Jesus. The idea is that they would be filled to the fullness of God with the fullness of God. The fullness carries with it the idea of God's moral excellence or perfections, including his presence, life, power, and especially his love. The reality of Paul's prayer is that he desires and prays specifically for the reader's comprehension of Christ's love for them and that they would be filled as to attain God's perfections. This prayer of Paul then sets the stage for the second half of the letter to the Ephesians, whereby Paul calls the Ephesian believers to action. See, Paul finishes chapter 3, and we've talked about how this book breaks into two parts. The first half is theological instruction. The second half is application. Now do with what you've been taught. And Paul says, be filled. As you're strengthened and as you're grounded and as you experience intimacy and as you're filled with the fullness of God, you're now ready to do the task that's been given to you. You're now ready to act. Specifically, Action of chapter 5, verse 2, where believers are called by the Apostle Paul to walk in love. Paul sees their filling as necessary to walk in love. I submit this morning, it's important to realize what Paul is saying in verse 20. Again, Paul specifically speaks to the depth, height, breadth, and length of God's resources. We've seen this a few verses ago. <coughs> He then says in verse 20 that God is able to do far more than we ever could ask or imagine. Think about that for just a moment. God is able to do more than you could even ask or think of. And Paul says that's not all that God can do. God can do even more. So there's the reality as we pray where we exhaust what we can think and what we can ask. And beyond that, God does more. That's what Paul said. 
God is able beyond what we can even think or ask to do. Specifically hear the phrase, far more abundantly. This phrase means quite beyond all measure. And what it communicates is, is the highest form of, of comparison that there is. What God is capable of doing cannot be fully grasped or understood. And when we grasp just how much God is able to do in the lives of his people, he can do more. Just when you think you've got it figured out, just when you think God has done that very thing that's going to change everything, that's going to change your life, that's going to change other lives, whatever the case may be, just when you think God, is, God has done it, we're there. God can do more. And God does do more. And in light of all that God does, lastly, Paul prays for God to receive the glory that he deserves. The last reason why Paul prays is for God's glory. I want you to understand that when God is given glory, it's not as though he's getting something that he doesn't already possess. Okay, God, God is glorified and has his glory whether we give it to him or not. But believers ascribe to God glory because of who he is and because of what he's done. When God works in your life, when God strengthens you and grounds you and you experience intimacy with God and, and the fullness of God by being filled, you want to praise God. You want to give him the glory. You want people to know what God has done. Pastor Aaron sent me this thing a couple weeks ago. I don't know where he finds this stuff. And I asked him, where do you find this? And um, he sent me this thing a couple weeks ago, and it was a little clip from a church. And um, it, it was a church that had an organ in there with Brian, and you know, the people that were kind of doing their thing. And there was the guy in front of the microphone, he was talking about, you know, tell us what God has done, you know, and the people, they're, they're getting it, right? And this guy, he makes his way down the aisle, and he's standing there, and the organ's burning, and, and, and he says, go on, Joe, tell them what God has done, right? Give glory to God. And, God looked, and, and Joe looks at the microphone, and he says, I just saved a bunch of money on my car insurance by switching to God. <laughs> and you can hear the people just start laughing. Right? Now, here's the reality. I don't know what was transpiring when Joe saved a bunch of money on his car insurance by switching to Geico. But I do know that that's a tremendous picture of God's children desiring to ascribe praise and glory to him when he works in our lives. The reality is when you experience the presence of God in your life, and I'm not talking about in a fanciful way. I'm not talking about I was overcome with this spirit. I had this feeling of emotion. I'm talking about when you can see God is at work in your life, you want to tell people. You want people to know how good God has been. You want people to know what God has done. And so Paul says, when these things, when, when we pray, when these are realities in our lives, the natural outflow is that we would glorify God. There's a close connection between the church and between Jesus Christ in verse 21. See, Paul desires that God would be glorified, demonstrating that he is worthy to be glorified by the church through what Christ has accomplished and will continue to accomplish. God is glorified. The church carries out its tasks in reaching the lost world. And when they make disciples, is they've been commissioned to do. Do you remember the young man we talked about when we began? Danny Simpson? Nobody ever told Danny the value of a 1918 Colt 45 semi-automatic pistol. This morning... Paul has told us, and I have told you, from the pages of Scripture, why Paul prayed. Because he knew the immeasurable riches contained within the ability to pray in communion with the God of the universe. Remember that God is able to do far more abundantly than we can ask or think according to his power and his riches and glory. This doesn't mean that we get to ask for whatever we want and God automatically gives it to us. But it does mean that as believers seek God through prayer, that they're strengthened, grounded, experience intimacy, filling, and then God is glorified. My challenge to you this morning 
be like David Simpson. Know that know what you have in prayer. And don't settle for less. Take advantage of what God has given to us through the act and through the gift of prayer. Be drawn closer to God as you're strengthened and be filled even beyond what you can think or ask. In turn, you'll be equipped to fulfill your role as ambassador for Jesus Christ. As we finish this morning, imagine with me what our church, just start right here, what our church might look like if each and every one of us took advantage of the opportunity to pray and to receive the blessing of it. As the church would change, it would, the community would change. Maybe just one person or one family at a time, but they would change. From one family at a time to a community. Eventually the change isn't limited to our church or to our community, but to the world <laughs> and the uttermost parts of it. The power of God for the believer is found through prayer. May you and I be praying people. And may we see lives change as a result of our praying, starting with our own. Let's pray. God, we thank you this morning for the gift of prayer. We thank you for the opportunity to experience fellowship with you, to know you in a more intimate way, to be strengthened by you, to be filled with your fullness, God, to be used by you, to be grounded in truths of Scripture. Thank you this morning for the gift and the privilege of prayer. As we consider prayer this morning, God, I just pray that you would burn in our hearts for the importance of it, for the necessity of it in our lives. I pray, God, that you would help us to see that prayer is not just something that we do because we're weak and we can't do things ourselves. Help us to see, God, that prayer is what we do to experience and fellowship with you. Prayer is what we do to receive your strength, whereby we could accomplish your task. Help us to see, God, that it is through prayer that the world will be changed. Help us to see, God, that that reality starts right here with us. Help us to be people, God, who are praying people. Help us to be quick to ascribe all glory and honor to you. God, not because you're not already glorified, because we want the world to know what you have done in us and through us. So we pray, God, that we would seek your face, that we would see you at work, that we would draw near to you, and that as we do, and God, as we look into your face, that the things of the world will grow strangely dim, and that we would be quick to offer you glory.
morning. Um, it, it is my prayer that everything you heard this morning was just a, yeah, that's right, we need to be praying. And those are good reasons for us to continue to pray. Um, but the reality is, some of you may be like me. From time to time in life, your prayer life struggles. And um, if that's the case, then I pray you'd be encouraged today, uh, knowing and understanding uh, what you have available to you in prayer.